Yes, uh, this is a workshop and it's a great workshop. I hope this will be a start up for more workshops everywhere because uh, Lee Corden is a very famous man in USA, let me say. So and uh, congratulations for your great jobs you are doing for the patients. Um, I start now with a laboratory presentation. It's not so easy to understand. I will hurry up a little bit because the time is restricted. We have an invader in the body, this is Borrelia burgdorferi, you know this bacteria, and this invader is eaten up by a macrophage, you know the macrophages eaten up bacteria, and then the macrophage presents a natural killer cell, the Borrelia, inside the macrophages, and then the natural killer cell will destroy Borrelia. This natural killer cell is the CD57 count natural killer cell, it belongs to the big natural killer cell groups, you know, each, everybody knows uh, the CD56 uh, natural killer cell in HIV infections. And this is what we look for in laboratory tests for the CD57 count. On the other hand, this macrophages presents uh, the TH0 cell, this Borrelia, and the TH0 cell will go or went into a TH2 cell. A TH2 cell is just a minute, is uh, in the next step a plasma cell and the plasma cell, you know the plasma cells, they produce the antibodies and the antibodies, they build complexes and then there will be a mast cell and the mast cell will uh, lead or leads to a histamine um, production and this is a big problem for Lyme patients too. On the other hand, you need this macrophages presenting by the antibodies because this complex is destroying Borrelia 2. On the other hand, we have the Th1 system and Th1 cell and Th1 cells are the T cells and the T cells are responsible to destroy Borrelia or other bacteria directly, which is not so known in the medical universities. That's a big problem. So we have three pathways to destroy Borrelia. It's a natural killer cell on the left side, it's the T cell and it's the antibody complex and this leads to this histamine release. So now we have different cytokine profiles and the cytokine profiles are for the Th1 cell interferon gamma, interleukin 2 and TNF beta. On the other hand, we have the Th2 system and the Th2 system uh, leads to the release of interleukin 10, interleukin 4, interleukin 5 and then we have the influence on the plasma cells and this is a not so easy to understand principle but you have to recognize that we need a lot of interleukins in our body for the defense, for the natural immune defense. And we have a big influence, but it's not so known in the whole medicine, of the Th1 cell. So you know about tuberculosis, Th1 cell reactions, you know about chronic fatigue syndrome, you know about HIV infections. In every disease is the T cell, the Th1 cell responsible for the immune defense. Candida infection, virus hepatitis C, leaky gut syndrome, multi-allergies, sepsis, Gulf for one syndrome and bacteria. And here's our Borrelia again. The development of diseases by the Th1 cell overreaction is, that means if you have a very high production of Th1 cells in your body, that you got rheumatoid arthritis, that you got multiple sclerosis, that you got Hashimoto thyroiditis. And these are diseases, let me go back, which are very common in our populations everywhere in the world. The TH influence of the Th2 cells is another one. So you could get psoriasis, you could get parasites, you could get influence on bacteria. If you have an overproduction of Th2 cells or reactions, then you have a systemic lupus erythematodus, an asthma, you have hay fever for example, you have Kraft versus host reactions, you have allergies, you have atopical dermatitis, or you have systemic sclerosis. This means if you have a dysregulation of two Th2 cells, or like before Th1 cells, you have some other problems in your body which are caused by another reason. So this is what Lee was discussing before. Um, in Europe it's not allowed to do 
an immunoplot for screening of Lyme patients actually because the CDC is still alive and the CDC in the first step they're just allowed to do an ELISA. But we know that the immunoplot technique is much more specific and sensitive than ELISA technique. That's proven. We have a lot of data about this. Let me go back. So what does that mean? We have a high risk of cases where there are positive immunoplots but negative ELISAs. That's proven. We all know about this situation. But the CDC is still not knowing this problem. However, on the other hand, we did in two years ago or three years ago an internal study. We sent the same sample of the same patient to several test producers of ELISA techniques in Germany. And these are the data. We sent 50 patients, that's a lot from our patients, uh, patients coming to our hospital Mostly they suffer from Lyme disease because there's no reason to drive to Augsburg, to fly to Augsburg uh, with, with very high cost and we do laboratory tests and they are uh, very high pre-selected for Lyme disease by the symptoms or by other colleagues. And we did this, yeah, what is it, a not double blind controlled study, but we sent exactly the same material to several ELISA test producers. This, they are very established, Esculap, Virion, Diazorin and Oroimun. And I will show you the data later. This is an example with what's my problem or our problem laboratory. The ELISA is very often negative and we have many bands in the IgG plot and many bands in the IgM plot. So if you, diagnosing doctors or naturopaths, if you do just an ELISA, you cannot find out this patient, that he has Lyme-specific antibodies. This is the question of sensitivity of a laboratory test. And this is now what I found out. Now let's go back. Now we have to go to this before. Yeah. That's what I found out. I found out, or not we, no, we found out. Uh, this was my colleague um, who helped me in this case. And we had a sensitivity from ESCLEP just of 42%. That means 42% sensitivity. If 10 patients come to your practice, then you got six misdiagnosed by the ELISA technique. We tested by Virion exactly the same serum. It was 44%. So six of 10 patients falls negative by ELISA. Diazorin, it was horrible. Seven patients, just 32%. Autoimmun, 42%, six of 10 falls negative in ELISA. If you look for an HRV test, is this for you okay? 40% sensitivity, would you say I got the same blood from a donor who has HIV infection, is it okay for you or not? That's a, an ethical question at the end. Okay, HIV is threatening for your life. Lyme disease, you could live with chronic Lyme disease, it's not, it's not actual threatening your life, so, but it's chronically threatening your life. But our other colleagues, they say there's no chronic Lyme disease and you don't need this test because there's no chronic Lyme disease. But I did this test. So this is an actual example I showed you before. And in this case, if you just do the ELISA, you misdiagnose Lyme disease. But if you do the immunoplot, then you will find antibodies, IgG and IgM. And the situation for you is, oh, antibodies, this could be an active Lyme infection, maybe. And then we looked for this constellation that was very interesting. In chronic, uh, we don't treat uh, bull's eye rashes, just a few. We treat chronic patients, patients chronic over years, uh, a decade of years for Lyme disease or some other infections. What we found out, 40% of our patients, of these 50 patients, they were IgG and IgM negative by immunoplot and by ELISA. By immunoplot technique, we found just 16% IgG positive and 
IgM negative. 12% they had a borderline uh, IgG production but negative IgM and so on and so on. But what's very important in this case we found altogether 10% of the patients they had an isolated IgM production in chronic Lyme disease, no IgG. That's very important in my eyes. So this is the conclusion, 40% seronegativity, 28% IgG rest titer, that means just IgG, 22% IgG and IgM persistence, 10% very important, an isolated IgM persistence. So if you find an Ig isolated IgM persistence in chronic Lyme, this is a sign for a chronic Lyme disease. And I'm not alone, what I'm telling you here, they are really new studies from 2011. In the case of ELISA, positive or borderline results were observed in only 24 patients. That means 53% sensitivity in this study. I think it was a Polish study. In the next study, 32% had specific antiborelli antibodies confirmed by using the Bestem plot in spite of negative ELISA. In patients with persisting difficulties, it is necessary to use the Western blood test. That's not my sentence, this is an independent study. It is probably due to the very low production, that means we have a borderline, very low production of antibodies in chronic Lyme, of specific antibodies caused also by the status of immune deficiency detected in all our patients. That means many of chronic Lyme patients have a secondary immune deficiency syndrome leading to no production of antibodies detectable by ELISA or better sensitive immunoplot. The next study, the number of IgM and or IgG positive ELISA results ranged from 34 to 59%. This group, like me, compared several test producers for ELISA with nearly the same results, 34 to 59. Comparison of immunoplots yielded large difference in inter-test agreement, that's another laboratory problem. Remarkably, uh, some immunoplots gave positive results in samples that had been tested negative by all eight ELISAs. They uh, compared eight diff uh, several ELISA producers from Europe, eight. I'm just doing four or five, they did eight. But what they said here in 2011, that there are cases with positive immunoplot but negative ELISA results. So the conclusion is you have a loss of sensitivity if you just do the ELISA technique of 16 up to 28 percent. The next or the biggest problem is a great number of patients will be not identified by the screening ELISA test and consequently excluded for Lyme disease not using the immunoplot as a screening test. Look, you are experts in this field but we have millions of doctors worldwide, they don't know about this problem. And if you don't know about the problem, you exclude Lyme disease by a negative ELISA because you think the quality of sensitivity is the same like an HIV ELISA or hepatitis, hepatitis B ELISA or something like that. That means the more specific immunoplot is the more sensitive and the better screening test. So throw out the ELISA is the first message, just do immunoplot for all of your patients. That means for us a senselessness for Borrelia ELISA technique in general, but just for Borrelia. Don't say Dr. Schwarzbach had said it's for all ELISA worldwide, that's just for Borrelia. Only Borrelia immunoplot technique should be allowed for all the systems as a screening test for Borrelia antibodies, not the ELISA. This was a case I had in May 2005. This patient was 40 three years old with persistent paresthesia of the left leg, 80% blindness of the left eye, procredient myalgia, recurrent dizziness and very important a substantial loss of power during work uh, with the threat of occupation disability. The first appointment in our laboratory practice was in October 2005. Uh, spinal fluid, all laboratory tests were negative, no Borrelia antibodies in the spinal fluid, no chronic IgG synthesis in form of oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid. The antibody tests all were negative, immunoplot 
and Eliza, everything was negative, so she was excluded for Lyme disease. Uh, they told her, you suffer from multiple sclerosis, and they gave, the doctors gave her more and more corticosteroids, and she got worse, 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 and uh, with a really bad fate at this point of time. And then that was for me the starting point uh, to do more in this field. Um, we did this LTT lymphocyte transformation test in October 2005 and we did this CD57 count and the CD57 count was low, it was 65 per microliter, microliter and the LTT it was high, it was a high lymphocyte transformation test result, the LTT was high for Borrelia burgdorferi. But there was no immune response in the immunoplot. That means this patient belonged, yeah, ha had belonged to this group of the seronegative chronic Lyme patients. And then this patient was treated with ceftriaxone, you know this, uh, with uh, infusion therapy for eight weeks. And you know what's coming out in such presentations. This patient got significantly improved and uh, this patient, I would say it's nearly healed until uh, nowadays and she's able to work again. And the correct diagnosis was or is chronic neuroborreliosis with multiple sclerosis like symptoms. And what you see here is a significant decrease of the lymphocyte transformation test after the treatment. So less T cellular immune reactions against Borrelia burgdorferi in this case. And now back to the aims of the immune competent cells. We have the CD57 count for the lysis of antigen antibody complexes, Borrelia burgdorferi. We have the T cells directly defeating or uh, destroying Borrelia burgdorferi or chlamydia, it's my favorite, chlamydia pneumoniae, or anaplasma ehrlichia and others. And we have the T cellular immune system responsible for the antibodies for Borrelia burgdorferi, chlamydia, mycoplasma, anaplasma, ehrlichia, babesia, and so on and so on. So, what should you do sitting here as a basic diagnostic panel for all of your Lyme patients? You should do for base, basic diagnostics the IgE and IgG and IgM antibodies inclusive VLSE, this is a specialty in the immunoplot in US. Uh, Lee does this C6 ELISA partly, I think by Igenix, this correlating to the European VLSE structure or it's, or it's part of the VLSE antigen structure. And we do this LTT test, we do the lymphocyte transformation test for the T cellular reactions against Borrelia burgdorferi and we do the CD57 count, but be careful and uh, not in the stage one of this Lyme disease, that doesn't make sense to do the CD57 count and for children we have a little bit problem. We don't have reference ranges for children. Actually, we are working on this project, by, but be careful uh, to say um, in, in children I have the same reference range like in adults for the CD7 count. You have to be careful with it. So you should do a laboratory staging process with each patient. You should do all three tests with each patient to know is there an active Lyme infection, a, cro a chronic Lyme infection or not. Back to the B cells. You know the, all the immunoplot. Uh, could you put up your fingers who knows or, or who saw an immunoplot live in a laboratory before? Did you see in laboratory such an immunoplot or is it a brand new field? Brand new field. <laughs> so Immunoplot is not so easy to understand. If you are interested, I could mail you some more information, but to explain all the bands, that would be one day or two days to explain you all the bands and the cost reactivity possibilities. That doesn't make sense. But you could take back, if you have an IgM positive immunoplot, you should find OSPC, that means outer surface protein C of Borrelia burgdorferi. This is an early stage marker. Early stage marker should be OSPC for Borrelia burgdorferi. 
For the ITG, it's very, very important to get a better sensitivity to use in all of your immunoplots in the countries the VLSE structure. The re it's a recombinant antigen. You cannot culture it, so you have to produce it by a recombinant, by a technique uh, for an increase of this VLSE structure. Uh, you do it in a laboratory, but you cannot uh, do it by culturing Borrelia. The others are not so important. Concentrate more on the VLSE in your countries. Ask your laboratories, do you do VLSE in your immunoplot? If not, the immunoplot is not the best and you lose a lot of sensitivity. This is the VLSE structure. This is an invariable structure of Borrelia. When the Borrelia is dead, each Borrelia dies after a while. Then you will find this VLSE structure, it's opened, it's an invariable region and the variable regions, uh, they, were, they died and then you have the invariable regions and then your body produces antibodies in vivo against Borrelia. So you could say, if I find VLSE in the immunoplot, this is an in vivo activity associated antigen structure. This is the anti immunoplot we use in our laboratory. I want to say one word. Uh, the specificity is not the problem of the immunoplot. The problem is the sensitivity, the false negative results. It's not the specificity. If you find Borrelia burgdorferi antibodies by immunoplot, those are antibodies. This is nothing else. This is not HIV antibody. This is antibody against Borrelia burgdorferi against, against these structures by this immunoplot. So this is an explanation for the recombinant antigens and uh, recombinant antigens means for you that they are not expressed in bacterial cultures, they are only in insufficient amounts like the VLSE. The native antigens, this is the normal culturing for Borrelia and we have a specificity of the immunoplots, all immunoplots 95 to 100 percent but then you have to use this VLSE in this immunoplot system and the sensitivity is around 60 percent. So you don't have to learn all the studies about this um, but this shows very impressive that there's enough evidence-based literature for false zero negativity of Lyme disease. If you're very interested in this field, I could mail you all the studies, this overview. We have a lot of studies. This is the next slide. False seronegativity by ELISA and immunoplot in Borrelia burgdorferi infections. Next, false seronegativity. The red ones, that's very interesting. These are names of the IDSA, of let's say the enemies of the islets in USA or the other opinion they have in the USA. And they found out all these IDSA guys, Detweiler, Stirl and Malavista and all those guys that it's possible to get a false seronegativity by the immunoplot technique, by several studies. The next slide, Klempner is a famous name in this year again. And okay, we don't have so many studies about an isolated IgM persistence in chronic Lyme. There's just a little bit about this, but there are just a few studies, but they are not so modern, the studies. What about uh, the spinal fluid? Does it make sense to uh, take spinal fluid, to do a puncture for spinal fluid with a risk, with a high risk for the patient? I don't think so. In chronic Lyme, it's just for, uh, chronic Lyme, my opinion. It doesn't make sense uh, because you have a lot of false negativity results. There's enough evidence-based literature about uh, this uh, spinal fluid and uh, to look for chronic neuroboliosis in the spinal fluid that doesn't make sense. Is it is useful to do a PCR in spinal fluid? Yes, but you should do the right PCR. PCR is not PCR. Um, we found out with a, by a study with Igenix uh, in US together that um, you should use um, the multiplex PCR to look for the plasmids. Each PCR has a sensitivity and you need four DNS molecules of Borrelia burgdorferi to get a positive result. So if you have a negative PCR, it cannot exclude it. 
So send the spinal fluid to Igenix for this multiplex PCR and then you got the information by the best PCR, don't use the nested PCRs in Europe. I never saw any positive result in many, many laboratories. I do a lot of these investigations, not in my laboratory, but I send them all to others in Europe, but no positive nested PCR results by our common used nested PCR results in Europe. Uh, that means in blood either. In, in blood, no positive results I ever saw in blood stream. Send it to Igenix, they have a sensitivity of around 70% uh, in the blood. That's not so bad in spinal fluid, but it's, it cannot exclude, you understand it. So, what about the T cells? This is my specialty, the ELISPOT lymphocyte transformation test, ELISPOT LTT. That should be done, this test, in each Borrelia burgdorferi patient. You, you have to do it in each patient because if you don't do it, you miss the answer of the T cells, of the TH1 system. You are missing them. That's uh, no good diagnostic feature. So, this is uh, what it looks like um, and it's a micro titer test here we're doing and you could use this ELISPOT LTT for a staging. You do it before, during and after treatment, this ELISPOT for the actual, this is a sign for an actual Borrelia activity. You have to learn this is a sign for actual Borrelia activity, this ELISPOT technique. You know it maybe from tuberculosis. In tuberculosis it's nearby gold standard worldwide and the FDA they approved, that's in USA, in May 2011 it's approved by the FDA this test, the ELISPOT for tuberculosis but not for Lyme, that's interesting. Uh, although in Lyme we just use a uh, Borrelia burgdorferi antigen in this test so you can could transpose this model. A positive result, these are the words of the FDA, a positive early spot result suggests that an infection is likely, a negative result that an infection is unlikely. And what's a great advantage of this test, we could finish such an early spot test in within 24 hours. It's a very rapid test, okay, you got the results a little bit later because we have some uh, post-analytical process and validation and so on, but you could do a first impression in 24 hours, it's a very quick test, the technique is very, very fast. And on the other hand, you have a new study, a brand new study, a Swedish uh, Dr. Sandström, Kenneth from your country, a brand new study. Uh, Borrelia antibody, uh, they looked in Sweden for children, for Borrelia antibody positive asymptomatic children, 20 children, with previous clinical Lyme borreliosis and controls, that means healthy patients. Blood samples were analyzed in this brand new study for Borrelia specific interferon gamma by the ELISPOT technique in Sweden. And they found no significant difference in the cytokine secretion between the groups. There was just a mild elevation of interferon, uh, no, interleukin-6, which was very borderline. And this study is from Skokman et al, Adaptive and Innate Immune Responsiveness to Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato. What does that mean? That means in exposed asymptomatic children. That means that this test has a 100% specificity of this ELISPOT technique. 100% according to this brand new study. That's fantastic. No, 100% is impossible. Let's say it's 99.999 because it's not, mathematically it's not possible to get 100% specificity. But this early spot is 100% or nearly 100% specific. That's fantastic. That's absolute fantastic. It's a brand new study, but nobody knows this study. You it's just 20. Huh? It's just no, no, no. It's 20 and 24. It's over 60 children. Over 60. Well, That's okay. enough for this study. Okay. That's okay. For a study design, it's okay. You cannot do 1,000, 10,000 children in Sweden. Mm -hmm. You don't have chronic Lyme in Sweden. Oh, it's not, it's, it's, uh, yeah, but it's uh, not, a, it's not ignored, it's ignored, it's ignored by the IDSA. Oh? So <laughs> you just have 60. Okay, you have, you have 20 patients. <laughs> Yeah, Sweden is very, Sweden is very eager in this, and uh, yeah. congratulations, and you are very inno innovative, very innovative in this study. You have settled a lot of Swedish patients. Sure. <laughs>
Okay, so what about the Elispot technique? The grey columns are before antibiotic therapies and the black columns you cannot see it very good here, but these are the cray columns. You see in many cases significant reduction under treatment. We don't have studies about this point, this is just a small case report. And we have a lot, no not a lot, but we have <laughs> Uh, let's say a little in between, a lot of uh, evidence-based literature about the LTT. These are the brand new studies we had from Skogman and uh, TB elimination. So this is the way the universities go. The University of Leipzig is now doing the early spot for Borrelia. So they got awake more and more in Germany too, I hope in other countries as well. The CD57 count, this is uh, very interesting to look for. The CD57 count we learned by the islets, it's reduced in chronic Lyme. So that means it's a chronic Lyme F activity. This CD7 count, the lower, the more chronic. You could get the message. The lower the CD57 count, the more chronic. Or the more chronic is the activity of Borrelia or maybe some other bacteria, we don't know. So that means after therapy, should it normalize uh, this CD57 count as an expression of therapeutic success for you, for the therapist, and it should reflect a progressive chronic activity of Borrelia burgdorferi. The reference range is not problematic. I have chosen a reference range of uh, 100. Um, some laboratories in US, they have chosen a, a reference range of 200. Some have uh, chosen a reference range of 60. Okay, this is again the question of sensitivity. We did a reference range for our laboratory of 100 and we had around 70% sensitivity by doing this. We, we did then a borderline of 100, 130 per microliter, but um, this is still a problem for children again. And there, yeah, we have to do more studies, I think, really for the CD57 count. This is a normal CD57 count and a normal, you saw such pictures from flow cytometry, I cannot explain you in a sh uh, this uh, 50 minutes, this uh, flow cytometry, but uh, it, this method uh, came from the HIV infections, from the CD4, CD8 ratio and the CD56 and you see here we are looking for the CD56 minus, CD3 minus, CD57 positive uh, population and then we do this not in a percentage, it's very important in this CD CDs, cluster of differentiation diagnosis, to do it per microliter because this is absolutely to standardize. And this was a patient with positive immunoplot with a high IgA production, no IgM antibodies but positive IgG antibodies, no activity in the LTT and the CD57 cells were 150. This was a healthy patient. Huh? Uh, this patient had Borrelia burgdorferi antibodies but uh, no signs for Lyme disease, but this patient had an isolated IgA production so we had to care more for the IgA than for Borrelia and the CD57 count was completely negative. This was a pathologic CD57 count, this was a patient with negative antibodies and with a positive lymphocyte transformation test, the early spot was high, 11 for 0 and this patient had no chlamydia IgA production but an IgG borderline production and a positive LTT for chlamydia pneumonia, it was 7 and the Elichia, early spot for Elichia was 6 but no antibody response for Elichia and just a week for Chlamydia. But on the other hand, the CD57 count was 68 per microliter and this patient was sick, suffering from several symptoms. And the leukocytes, that's uh, in some Lyme patients, you know, they are very low in some cases. A positive but a good 57. That sounds not so bad and they are sick. Very sick. So they have a very strong natural killer cell system on this set. Do they, these patients, do they have antibodies? Do they express antibodies? No antibodies, but just the T cell spot is high and the antibodies nothing and CD7 is cut. Maybe those patients, um, do you treat them with natural killer cell products? Do you? 
Yeah, there are some natural killer cell to elevate it. No, this. Uh, I think um, first let me do it, otherwise it would be too late. We have a lot of time for discuss later um, because it's a little bit more stuff. Um, CD57 count, we have a little bit uh, evidence-based literature about CD57 count. Important for me is the pre-analytics. Use the right tubes in the right time schedule during taking blood in your practice. First use a serum tube. If you take blood you have a stability of the antibodies for weeks. Then use the CBT or CPDA tube for the early spot. Uh, be careful in the vitality. The early spot is a vitality test. It's no quantity test. CD57 is a quantity test. This is a vitality test of the gamma interferon release of, Borrelia, of the antigens of, uh, against in this, uh, in this test system. So up to three days if you use this CPT uh, and CPT TA use uh, tubes, please use the yellow tubes. Don't use the heparin, heparin tubes. They are not stabilizing enough. Um, we, we ignore the heparin tubes. Some laboratory, uh, oh, the battery is a little bit empty, but we do it furthermore. Uh, we need some energy. <laughs> we, we need some Nutramedics product for the uh, laptop. And then you take the heparin tubes and the EDTA tubes. This is uh, the range. I have to put the OK. Yeah, low energy is not so bad. We need a power source. Yes, Borrelia burgdorferi is the chameleon of symptoms and laboratory tests. And what about the co-infections? That is um, our bigger problem, I think so. We have a lot of problems with Babesia. We have, we all know about this Bartonella problems, Elichia problems, and my favorite is Chlamydia. This is worldwide number one problem. Then we have Rickettsia, Coxella, and we have the second big problem, it's Mycoplasma. And we have a lot of viruses, you heard it by Lee Coden, EBV virus, CMV virus. Thank you, Lee, for supporting my energy. Otherwise, we have to use the Nutramedics product by Mark and Tim. So, what about this Chlamydia? Are you experiencing Chlamydia infections? Do you know about this problem? Yes. Chlamydia is, um, or Chlamydophila pneumonia is cremnegative. It's just intracellular. You have to learn it's just intracellular. There are no extracellular forms. It's an airborne infection, human to human, ticks, question mark, or reactivated in Lyme disease. But we know that many horses, koalas in Australia, frogs are infected. They have in Australia hospitals for koalas. The, the veterinarians knows about, uh, know about all the horses problem. The symptoms are cough, Cough, slight thrown pain, hoarseness, sinusitis, atypical pneumonia, meningoencephalitis, and so on and so on. But what's very important uh, is for me to learn about the associations of this chlamydia bacteria. It's highly associated with Alzheimer's disease, it's highly associated with multiple sclerosis, depressions, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, heart attacks, acute ischemic strokes, atherosclerosis, autism, autism, big problem, Parkinsonism, and rheumatoid arthritis. So you have exactly the same syndromes like Borrelia. You cannot say is it a Borrelia infection or is it a chlamydia infection. Okay, you could correlate it with a tick bite. Most patients, they don't remember of a tick bite. But then you have laboratory, and this is my existence, laboratory test. You do the LTT test for it, the ILISPOT test, and you find masses of them. You find 80, 90 percent of your Lyme patients are co-infected with chlamydia. And what's very interesting, the IgA production. IgA is a new study in apoplectic ischemic strokes. 60 percent of ischemic strokes are all chlamydia infected. It's a big problem. It's a brand new study from uh, 2011. So, do in each case of your patients chlamydia pneumonia, you could do it in each Lyme patient. Do it in each Lyme patient. You, feel, you will find thousands, let's say, I don't know how many. So, and do the IgA. That's important. IgA production, local standing antibody, two weeks half lifetime, and do the L Elispot LTT. The next problem for your doctors or for yourself is Nobody can remember all symptoms of all co-infections in their own prey. That's not possible. 
you cannot remember if you read a lot of books about all co-infections, you are not able to, s to name all possible symptoms in each co-infection. That's in my eyes impossible. You, you, you have to buy a notebook for this. So, and the next problem you have, you cannot say is this symptom, is it coming from Babesia, is this symptom from Bartonella, is this symptom from Chlamydia. They are overlapping the symptoms. Next problem. So that was for me a, a bad thing. If I read in different uh, books, scientific books about chlamydia, mycoplasma, rickettsia, about all this stuff. So we developed then a co-infection checklist for the patient. I give you one co-infection checklist round. I don't have it here. But this co-infection checklist was, let me say, breakthrough in our diagnostic features. In the symptoms for a co-infection, the more symptoms you have for a co-infection, the more probable is the co-infection. And then you have a ranking list afterwards, if you do it, of the co-infection according to the number of the symptoms belonging to each co-infection. That has to do something with the predictive value of symptomatology. This is on-field clinical symptomatology. How specific is a symptom for which cancer, for which disease, for which infection? That's not so easy. And then you doctor, you could do uh, this ranking list for yourself and you have several advantages by this. You have a higher predictive value of the ordered laboratory tests and you save a lot of money for the patients. It doesn't make sense to do all laboratory tests for $5,000. I saw lab reports in the US, they cost $5,000 for nothing. There were just two or three results positive. Why? Because uh, the doctors don't know each co-infection about all the symptoms. That's uh, really a problem. And then we wrote all for the solution. That's Bob Pransfield somewhere in the middle rowing uh, the coastal region of Hawaii. We developed this co-infection checklist to be filled out by the patient. And then you got a ranking of each co-infection, Elichia, Babesia, Rickettsia, Bartonella, Chlamydia, Chlamydia pneumonia, Trachomatis, Yersinia, Mycoplasma, Coxsackie virus and EBV virus. And then you doctors, you got this ranking tool for medical doctors. And I want to show you just a few cases. I can show you thousands of cases. I do each day 10 cases worldwide for patients. It's every time the same. And this patient filled out with stomach ache, fever, feverish feeling, lack of concentration, forgetfulness, yellowish color of the skin, painful joints, general aches, flu-like symptoms, and heart problems, and uh, headache, and all the symptoms, fatigue, and muscle pain. And then we came to a ranking, and we find out that eight symptoms were for chlamydia pneumoniae, seven symptoms for mycoplasma, seven symptoms for kaiseki, six symptoms for Bartonella, and then you got a ranking here, position one of the possible co-infections is chlamydia pneumonia with eight symptoms, position two is mycoplasma, Coxsackie virus, position two, uh, two and position three is Epstein-Barr virus with six symptoms. And then you could decide which test makes more sense than the other to spare the cost for a patient. And we did this test for the patient. We did an immunoplot for Borrelia, the patient was full of bands in the IgG. We did the ELI spot, there's was very high activity. We did the CD57 count, it was low, 49. And we did the chlamydia antibodies and you see full active in chlamydia, full activity for chlamydia in the early spot for chlamydia pneumonia with 46 stimulation indices. That's a big problem. That means a dominant chlamydia infection, um, minor Borrelia problem. And then you cannot say, is this CD57 count specific for Borrelia or is it specific for chlamydia? You cannot say it. N nobody did a study for it. Ray Stricker told me two years ago, I mean, do a study for it, okay. We do a study in our, our European project, a study for it. We will do it with a few patients. But this is my daily routine work, what I do. I see really thousands of patients with this constellation, chlamydia problem, Borrelia problem. This is multiple infection. Patient two, the same. This is chlamydia, five symptoms, position one, position two, Bartonella, Coxsackie virus, and we did the laboratory test with the chlamydia pneumonia activity, 10 in the early spot, IgA was 1.6. We had a 
IgM persistence, that's interesting in this case, IgM immunoblot was pers uh, persistent and the Borrelia fully antigen was 27 and so on. And you see here mycoplasma problem too, mycoplasma pneumonia problem in IgE. This is not so seldom. The more you do for mycoplasma, you, the more you will find out in these cases. And many patients, they start with a cough in the history in the anamnesis that it's not Lyme disease but the symptoms are overlapping with Lyme disease. Maybe this patient is suffering from Lyme disease, um, mycoplasma problem and chlamydia. Three infections in one patient by laboratory results. Patient three, position one again, chlamydia pneumonia, it's in each case patient you will find it. The same results, chlamydia pneumonia activity, uh, anti nuclear antibodies were positive, so you have to look for collagenosis to do the double strain DNS and you have to do the ENA. The Borrelia problem, again, no antibodies, so each case is different, the sensitivity of the test is different, the immune systems are different. And this last patient, I sent the blood to Igenix because of this Borrelia activity and the blood was positive by multiplex PCR. That's a fantastic case. You could do more of these cases if you want, you could do studies by your own. And then I looked for this correlation of these results for chlamydia pneumonia, IgA, IgG, ELISPOT in a patient's group and I found out that these 50 patients, 60% had IgA problems, IgA uh, as an active uh, sign for an active infection, IgG problem and the LTT was high. If you do all three together, three tests together, you have a sensitivity of 78%. So if you do just one test, you lose sensitivity. That was the question of your CD7 count. So well, we have no easy to diagnose um, bacteria. Chlamydia has subspecies as well, uh, and it could be in cystic forms, in aberrant forms, very difficult, and it has biofilms, so very difficult to diagnose. Borrelia sensitivity, if you do the LTT, if you do the IgG, IgM immunoplot and if you do the CD57 count you had or you have 90% sensitivity and this is not bad but still you have 10% of Lyme patients with my laboratory test completely negative no LTT no antibodies so nevertheless the clinical uh, symptomatology has uh, is on position one and then you, you do the laboratory test not do the laboratory test and say is it Lyme or not Lyme you are the expert in uh, the symptomatology in the symptoms first look for the symptoms and then diagnose and laboratory is helpful it's not proving it cannot prove a disease PCR is more proving than LTT that's obvious but uh, it's not excluding anything so be careful with the laboratory result they are very have helpful like if you go to a radiologist with the, uh, and you do NMR or something like that, it's not excluding everything in NMR. So practical example, the staging, I want to show you just one example for staging process. The Borrelia was, antigen was positive, 14, 4, 3 in this patient for peptide mix and LFI1 and we had a very low CD57 count 24, chlamydia activity was 18. This patient had before treatment chronic fatigue, loss of power, brain in both thumbs, numbness in the fingers of the right hand, muscle cramps, muscle weakness, pain in the right shoulder, neck pain, concentration problems, ataxia. This uh, patient has a combination of a musculoskeletal and neurological, let's say, Lyme disease and um, with a chlamydia problem too. So laboratory diagnosis is multiple infection with Borrelia burgdorferi and chlamydia pneumonia with actual cellular activities in the ILI spot and chronic cellular activity in the CD7 count. This patient was treated by azithromycin, artemisinin, doxycycline, probiotics, vitamins, minerals. And this patient significantly increased with the symptoms and you see here that the activity we go back it was 14 it was lower to 9 and the CD57 count is better 24 up to 71 that's a prognostic better sign than a very low CD57 count and uh, the improvement was in all symptoms after six weeks of this strategy with uh, nearly free of any pain persistent loss of power and that means that it's a multiple infection with Borrelia and Chlamydia, furthermore with decreased actual cellular activities in the early spot and increase in the CD7 cells in comparison with the results six weeks before the start of therapy. So that means for you, uh, please treat this patient a little bit longer.
So this is a little bit complicated. You can see it with the, the stress. I think I go over this because it uh, would cost too much time. But now, yeah, it's really too complicated. <laughs> what about the herbal? We are sitting here in a workshop and I want to say some <laughs> for the traumatics products. Um, but in this slide, uh, we have adrenal fatigue. And for the adrenal fatigue, you have Chisantra, you have Astralagus, you have Rhododendron caucasicum, you have ginseng, you could use rhodiola, you and for the stress, anxiety, sleeplessness, you could, could use the amantilla, and you have the herbal support. That's for me interesting to find now correlation with the TH1 system and your herbs. That's a, a, a new, uh, let's say, for me, a new effort to do in the next time. Um, you have Samento. For the TH1 cells, you have Kumanda for the support of TH1 system. You have the Quina and you have the Takuna, you have the Noni, you have the Bandarol, and you have the Burberry, and the Glucane, and the Procyanidine, and the Melatonin, and the DHEA, and the Selene. So you have a lot of products influencing in a positive way the TH1 cells. That's pro not proven, but uh, we know it about this by some studies. Hmm? So DHEA is interesting, melatonin is interesting, and a lot of Samento, Comanda, and all of your products, they have an influence on the TH1 system. So this is what I'm working out during my studies the last weeks by looking, and zinc, oh, zinc, I forgot the zinc, and the magnesium, oh, magnesium, sorry, magnesium. Tin magnesium is improving the TH1 system according to literature. The herbal support for TH2 cells is Myrrhe, that's a favorite of Dr. Huismann's Myrrhe, you use uh, Myrrhe, statins, red wine for example, and progesterone, interesting. So you have a hormonal influence of the, or for the 2H2 system, for the antibodies, that's not bad. And let me say one word, the better the immune response of a patient in the T cells, in the early spot, the higher the activities, the higher the antibodies, the higher the CD57, the better for a patient. So that means it's a natural immune response. You have to think on the other hand, not say antibody is a bad thing. I want to put this antibody away. I want to put this T cell immune defense away. This is natural immune defense. This is helpful for a patient. You will see many patients, they improve in the T cells. They have higher LTTs, higher early spots during treatment and they feel better. Why? Because now the T cellular immune suppression has gone. That's good for a patient. But you have to understand it. It's not so easy to understand. So, now my summary and conclusions. The sensitivity of ELISA in chronic Lyme disease, we learned it, is around 30-40%. Sensitivity in immunoplot is just 60%. ELISA tests are too insensitive and useless. Negative antibodies in the immunoplot cannot exclude Lyme disease. And IgM antibody persistence is a sign for chronic Lyme disease. There's a possibility of false negative CSF, that means spinal fluid results. 86% of patients with chronic Lyme disease are co-infected with chlamydia pneumonia, multiple infections. Borrelia or chlamydia mycoplasma pneumonia symptoms are not high specific, they are overlapping symptoms. Patients can be co-infected by other bacteria in the tick, Babesia, Bartonella, Rickettsia, Lichia, Anaplasma. You should do a ranking of the co-infections and you could do it by this co-infection checklist. A staging of Lyme disease and co-infection should be done by modern laboratory tests. Use the recombinant immunoplots inclusive VLSE. Use the Elispot LTT. Use CD57 count to reach a higher sensitivity before antibiotic or other therapeutic decisions. Modern laboratory tests like the more sensitive Borrelia immunoplot, not ELISA, don't do the ELISA for Borrelia, Chlamydia, IgA, IgG, ELISA, CD57 count, Elispot LTT, Borrelia, Chlamydia, they should be done in a test package. So don't miss this chlamydia and mycoplasma problem. Stress by infections needs adrenal support therapies and amantilla for sleeplessness, anxiety, mood swings. You have it in your product line. And infections need TH1 support. Use Samento, use Comanda, use Quina, use Takuna, use Noni, use Banderol, use Burberry, use Melatonin, use Magnesium and others. So that's no bad way and we have a lot of patients, they improve under this uh, Lee Corden protocol, surely. And let's say thank you for your attention. <laughs>